Hi, I'm Dan Piqueno. This is my cousin Ben Piqueno. I've asked him to uh, sit down for an interview because my cousin Ben's been involved in the horse industry and I don't know anything about horses. But uh, what he told me some months ago at his home in Rhode Island really impressed me. So, cousin Ben, tell us, uh, tell us about yourself. Well, my name is Ben Piqueno. I was born and raised in Pawtucket, Rhode Island. And in 1965, my parents decided to move just over the line to Lincoln, Rhode Island. And uh, they had a riding academy in a place called Lincoln Woods. And it was only about a half a mile away. It was a very short walking distance. And uh, I met some of the neighbors and some of the, the kids that lived in a, a new town of Lincoln. And one of them, apparently, his father was a lawyer, and he used to take him horseback riding every Sunday. So they invited me to go along, and uh, of course, I fell in love with it, and uh, I really liked horseback riding, and I, that was, I was eight years old at that time. And uh, by the time I was 10, after going every Sunday for a couple of years, I asked the owner of the horse bun if I could have a job there. And he asked me, how old are you? And I says, well, I'm 10 years old. And he says, well, come see me when you're 12. So I kept that in the back of my mind. And the day I turned 12 years old, I approached the gentleman. His name was Al. Uh, he owned the place called Lincoln, Lincoln Woods Riding Academy, but we nicknamed it Al's Barn. And the day I turned 12, I went up to Al and I said, Al, can I have a job? And he said, how old are you? And I said, I'm, I just turned 12. And he says, OK, you've got a job. So uh, it was summer, uh, so I wasn't in school, so I worked uh, seven days a week uh, for a starting pay of $5 a day. I'd get there about six in the morning and stay till eight or nine o'clock uh, each night, cleaning the horses and cleaning the stalls and feeding them, putting the saddles on. And it was a, a place where they rented out horses. So it was $3 an hour. You could come up and, and ride a horse. We had an hour riding trail through the woods and my job was to get the horses prepped and I was a trail guide. I'd just escort the, uh, the group of people that wanted to go for a trail ride. And by the time I was 15, I was at top pay of $15 a day, which equivalent to $15 a day, $105 a week. Well, you're a rich man. It was actually, it was more than my mom was making in the factory. Wow, the <laughs> that's interesting, Ben. And, and it was tax-free. So, uh, I, uh, my mom would actually come up and uh, bring me a lunch on my, uh, between trail rides. She'd actually pull up in, in front of the barn in her car and wait for me to come riding in and hand me my lunch. And I'd turn around and go right back out and I'd eat my lunch on horseback. So, it was so long, excruciating days, but I loved it as a kid. And then uh, I was 15 years old, making the top pay at the riding academy in Lincoln Downs, which was just another mile away. And uh, also there was Narragansett uh, race track that's also in Rhode Island. They used to race horses year round the thoroughbreds. And uh, I wanted to uh, open up my Verizons and see if I could make a little more money and gain a little more experience in the, in the horse racing business. So I moved across the street and uh, to Lincoln Downs, and I found a job that paid actually about twenty dollars a day. So I was getting myself a promotion. The problem is, you're supposed to be sixteen years old uh, to work on the racetrack, and I was only fifteen. So I found a hole under the fence where I'd sneak in every morning and uh, do my work. But uh, the FBI, there was twenty-one FBI agents in the state of Rhode Island at that time. And 19 of them were at the racetracks and okay. the horses because there was a lot of... That's where the activity of, was. Yeah, that's where all the action was back in the uh, early 70s. So, you know, this one FBI agent used to come down the end of my barn every single morning and say, Oh, Ben, you got to leave. So I'd pretend I'd be walking out the gate and they'd believe I'm walking home. And when I get a chance, I'd turn around and crawl right back under the fence again. And, and I kept my job there till I was 16. And then, of course... Uh, when I was 16, I was uh, fingerprinted and they gave me a badge that would allow me to get in and out of the, the horse area with the horseman. And I actually had a tack room. It was just a little 10 by 10 cement block room when I put my uh, a little bed there and had some change of clothes. And I actually lived there, right there with the horses so I wouldn't have to go back and forth to, to home every day. And that carried on to when I went on to work at other tracks as well. But Lincoln Downs and Narragansett Park, especially Narragansett, was a very famous track back in the 50s, just before my time, 
where people would take trains in coming from New York, Philadelphia, Boston, um, to, to watch the racing because it was quite a spectacle uh, in the 50s. But by the time I got involved in the early 70s, everything was starting to depreciate, everything was starting to go downhill. And as you know, a lot of the horse tracks have been uh, folding up over the years. It seems like just a couple of major tracks and a few major cities that are uh, existing today, like New York, California, and Florida, are the three biggest that I can think of right now that are still sustaining the, the horse business. Uh, of course, with OTB, you can bet on horses all over the country. Um, okay, and, what's and OTB? Off-track betting. Okay. So you just go to a, a casino and they'll have the TVs of all the different races going, even dogs, horses, and now they're getting into sports betting as well. So you can go to these casinos and bet on uh, pretty much anything now. But uh, after uh, I went to work uh, at Lincoln Downs, I worked for a gentleman called Richard Angus, and he had a daughter named Debbie Angus, and I did stay with them for, for several years till I was about 18. And I do remember before I went to college that I worked at Suffolk Downs for a while, and that was an hour away from my home, and I had to leave at like four in the morning to beat the traffic, the rush hour traffic in Boston. Um, I'd get there about six in the morning, and sometimes I'd stay until six at night and drive home, get my sleep, and then drive back. That was kind of, um, that made it a long day, especially because horse business is seven days a week. And the horses need care every day. Uh, but my dad always wanted me to go to college, and I, I was really content with the horse business. Uh, I really loved what I was doing, but my dad says, no, you've got to go to college. And I says, okay, I'll go to college, but I want to go for the horse industry. Okay. So I found uh, one of the first schools in the country that offered a Bachelor of Science degree uh, in equine science. And uh, it was pretty expensive, and it was just a three-year course. But in those three years, I could achieve a, a four-year degree, a Bachelor of Science degree. So come to find out, I was actually one of the first males in the world uh, to, be, to get that Bachelor of Science. There were hundreds and hundreds of girls, because the college that I went to, you might as well say it was like an all-girls school. It was six guys to 300 girls in my class. And they had huge dormitories, and the guys, six of us guys, uh, stayed in one little house. Um, but it, it was funny for me because I was getting paid to take care of the horses to clean and groom and, and, and feed them and, and uh, all that stuff. And now I have to pay. <coughs> To learn off the college, and that, that it was basically the same thing. Waking up at five, six in the morning, feeding the horses, cleaning the stalls, and cleaning the horses. Then you jump to a, a well, you go to breakfast, and then have a class, and then you go back to help, you know, cleaning the horses. At noontime, you'd feed them. Uh, what I learned in college is it's better to feed them more often. Every they'd, they'd feed them four times a day. Um, some people that are you know prior to going to college would only feed them once or twice a day. Uh, on, at the racetrack, it was only like twice a day. Uh, but at college, I learned the more times you feed them, less amounts, smaller amounts, more frequently, okay. it's better for their digestive system. So you're feeding the horses four times a day, so it's like eight, uh, ten, two, and, and four. You're constantly. Uh, you're busy. Got, got something to do, yeah. And I, and I, I paid the college tuition to do all that work. Not only that, they made us uh, make our beds and make sure. Uh, Clothes were folded, and we have dorm inspections. So it was kind of like being in the military gotcha. as well. Uh, but it was an in interesting experience. I ended up achieving a riding master's certificate, uh, which certified me for uh, dressage level and jumping level uh, English and Western. And what is dressage level? Dressage is the top of the the top of the cream of the crop. It's like uh, you can you use two hands to, to you're riding in English. Western is one hand. Uh, both reins and you're just kind of whipping the neck around like this. Uh, English are using two hands and you turn uh, uh, something like that. Okay. And uh, you want to keep the horse's head bowed uh, and that keeps the, his arch spined and keeps the horse in balance. Now when you get into the real top level dressages you can get some of those horses like dancing in place, dancing sideways, doing these fancy steps. So it's like the high, high uh, end of the uh, range of uh, riding and uh, what I learned is after all those years of being a trail guide and working at Lincoln Woods and helping people guide them through all the, the trails 
I didn't know anything about riding a horse. Okay. When I, when I got there, I felt like an idiot. I've been riding for like 10 years since I was eight years old. I was 18 years old, and I didn't know the first thing about riding. I used to ride a horse with my legs wide open, and and, and they taught me, you know, you keep your toes in, your knees squeezed. There's a whole science to it. And actually, I had, uh, when I graduated, a couple of buddies of mine that worked with me at Lincoln Woods uh, came to watch me uh, graduate, and, and they were impressed. They, they, they were blown away that, uh, to see the way from I used to ride and how they taught me to ride properly. But it was one year at Meredith Manor, and then uh, two years of college. And the college was Salem College in Waverly, West Virginia. And uh, I actually only went one year there, and then I ended up coming back home to Rhode Island and got some college credits locally which gave me my 64 college credits, but I did that in three years and got my Bachelor of Science degree. And uh, then, of course, when I finished my education, I went right back to the racetrack, and I, I, was, I remember working up in Rockingham in New Hampshire, and I worked for a gentleman named Carl Grusmark, who had some nice horses at the time. Um, but I had applied immediately after I got my Bachelor of Science degree, I applied for, to Cornell University because they had an elite school of uh, horse showing called Faria, a Faria certificate. And they take, uh, I believe it was 300 applicants every year, and they only take one. So uh, I was, uh, it took me a couple of years of applying and reapplying and reapplying, but I think because of my Bachelor of Science degree and my, my uh, pushing to, to try to get in there, they accepted me. The problem is, once I got accepted and I went to, to learn all about horse showing, which is the most important part of a horse, they say no hoof, no horse. Uh, and then uh, and the showing and the corrective showing, now you can get a horse that walks crooked like this and you can put the right shoes on him and balance him so that he walks straight. It was incredible to learn. Um, I probably knew more about horses, hoofs than most veterinarians at the time. And when I graduated uh, with the Bachelor of Science degree, at that time, in 1978, I was considered one of the top 10 in the world for uh, being educated in the horse industry. Um, but I remember uh, learning how to sew a horse's hoof uh, together. If you had a horse that had a cracked hoof, it was severely cracked, that horse would be in severe pain. He'd be limping along and very uncomfortable. And I learned that you can take a drill and drill some really small holes on both sides of the crack you put some screws in there, very small screws because you don't want to go too deep past the horn, and then you lace it up with wire and, and very tightly with the wire you squeeze the hoof together. Got it. And then you put a fiberglass patch over the whole thing. Got gotcha. And then of course the, the, uh, with the nice tight shoe, the shoe would hold the fiberglass. Uh, yeah, all together. And you put the shoe on with perhaps a toe clip, and and that horse would go from pain to. Insane, you feel great after you'd be jumping around. Hey, and yeah, so you do the horse a favor, yeah. So that's something that's real important uh, that I learned. But the problem was, uh, I, I also learned that I'd have to be bent over my whole life, okay, and smelling horse shit and banging on the horse shoes. And, and these horses are some hoofs are bigger than basketballs, and of course, you get the little ponies. Um, but it was very strenuous work, especially on a person's back, because you're hunched over your whole life. Could have made a fortune, but I could make thousands of dollars a day. But you'd be hunched over today. I have, I have a hunch back today. Yeah. So, so that was the thing that I learned about you know, being a horse shoer, is uh, I learned a lot from it. I know a lot about doing it, which is good. So if I have some horses, I can tell my blacksmith how I want them shot. <coughs> but yeah, so after, uh, all the education, and uh, I ended up going to uh, Philadelphia, and I ended up working for the Anguses again because they okay. were in the Poconos, and that was the time where they had that uh, incident with a nuclear explosion. I don't know if you remember that back in the late seventies. Three mile out. Yes, and a lot of the horsemen were fleeing one of the tracks, and they were coming out to the mountains where it was safe. Uh, but anyway, from from the Poconos, I ended up I ended up with another gentleman in uh, Meadowlands, and uh, he was a younger Polish fella. I can't even think of his name right at the moment. Um, but I was working in Meadowlands, which was a new racetrack at that time. They had indoor bonds with heat lamps, 
you could give your horse a shower indoors. You should, you know, you'd be out from the elements. You wouldn't have to be outside. Uh, it was a nice track because it was brand new at that time. Super Martin. Um, Billy Kowalski, that's the the, All right. the the guy that I was working for. And uh, just one quick story, because after after I graduated uh, college also, I went to work on this farm called Marsh Farms. It was owned by J.D. Marsh, and he was the founder of A. Aetna Life Insurance Company. Multi-millionaire, lived up in a mansion with like four pillows in front of it, and uh, had elevators and central uh, vacuum cleaning. and. You know, Pretty extravagant, but he had hundreds of horses and they were all worth millions each. I remember he went to Japan and bought one horse for seven million dollars, a 30 year old broodmare. Okay. Just because the blood of that mare was Hyperion. And Hyperion is one of the foundation fathers of horses. Because they, they say it doesn't matter how fast, uh, who owns them, doesn't matter who trains them, and it certainly doesn't matter who rides them. They can only go as fast and as far as they are bred to go. So in the horse racing thoroughbred business, it's all about the breeding. So I mentioned this horse Hyperion, who goes way back to the kings and queens hundreds of years ago, and, and, and this was a descendant of Hyperion Philly. And I think I said seven million, but I'm mistaken. It was $30 million he bought that broodmare for from Japan, and only ended up getting one foal because the horse was so old. Yeah, uh, you know, she couldn't, but just for that one horse. But he had so, made. So, so was there a, sh a shipping charge? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> definitely no free. Shipping. Or was it free shipping? <laughs> okay, go ahead. So, and the uh, thing I wanted to mention about J.D. Marsh, uh, working on his farm, I had an opportunity uh, as an assistant trainer, uh, working with the two-year-olds and yearlings, and um, I learned about one particular one that was uh, super intelligent, super athletic. If they, if they had a bunch of these babies out in the field and you just whistle or snap your fingers and they, they'd all come running because they knew it was time to eat. This one was always a half a mile ahead of everybody else. He would just kick up and choom, he'd be the first one there. Okay. Meanwhile, the rest of the herd would be trying to catch up. And you could tell that he was super athletic because he'd curl up in a ball and he could kick um, you know, sideways. He was like a, a super athlete. And uh, I, I got attracted to that one in particular because uh, he was so intelligent. It was very, very easy to teach. Um, so one of the first things I taught him was if I just clicked my finger at his hoof, he'd pick it up and hold it there while I clean it. So I wouldn't even have to hold his leg okay. to clean his feet every day. And I'd go to the back leg and stop my finger and he'd just pick it up and hold it right there. I also taught him how to lead without a, sh a shank. I wouldn't even have to put a chain on him, no halter or anything. I would take two steps, he'd take two steps right on the side of me, just like you might teach a dog. Gotcha. But he was so smart, he picked it up very quickly. And uh, I could actually start running a little bit, a little bit of a jog, and he would actually gallop right on the side of me. And I'd just stop dead. And, he would stop then his back legs, his front legs would always stay in line with my front leg, with my two legs. But I remember one day he stopped so fast as his rear legs slid right out in front of both of our legs. Uh, but super athletic. And I was so impressed with the way he was learning. Uh, I told the trainer uh, on the farm, I said, hey, I want you to see something. And so he, we had him cross-tied. Unfortunately, he was facing out, looking at the racetrack, and there were some horses out there uh, training. So they were racing around, making noise. And he had his ears up, not paying attention to me. He was looking outside, watching those other horses run around. So the trainer, whose name was uh, Mr. Flynn, he was a previous trainer at the Hobo Farms in Florida, which is a prestigious farm. But he was the trainer for J.D. Marsh. And uh, J.D. Marsh has this Prince Henry cult that, that was fabulous. and. I taught him a few things very quickly, and I wanted to show it off. And I said, hey, Mr. Flynn, watch this. So I went to snap my finger for him to give me one hoof to clean it. It's a very simple trick. And he picked up both his front legs at the same time. Okay, you weren't expecting that, were you? <laughs> no, because he wasn't paying attention. He to was before. watching the other horses. He had his mind out. He was distracted. So, yes, and he picked up both, and he fell to his knees on, on asphalt.
Oh. And the trainer saw that. He says, are you crazy? This isn't a circus. You know how much that horse is worth? You're trying to get us both fired? So he and you know, made him a disaster out of that. So I never showed Mr. Flynn anymore my tricks. Okay. <laughs> but going back to that Billy Kowalski, that, that, the gentleman I worked for at Meadowlands, I saw that horse racing at Meadowlands after a long layoff. His name was uh, Prince something. I didn't know he was a prince. But I told Billy, because that horse was entered for the first time in his life in a claiming race. So you know the caliber of races. They start off way at the bottom at claiming level, then they go up to allowance, handicap, and then, then the high stake races, grade one, two, and three. So a claiming horse, a uh, claiming race basically means that that horse could be purchased. Um, somebody that's uh, involved in that racing arena uh, can have the money in the account. And if there's two or three people all going after the same horse, they would draw pills, like pool, the pool pills. They shake, and they put three pills in there, number one, two, and three, because there's three people that put in a claim. They all want that number one horse in that particular race. And what happens is as soon as the bell rings and the starting gate opens, the horse leaves the gate, that becomes somebody else's horse. But the, the guy that owned him, when he, they enter the race, gets the prize money. So he could win the race, and the guy that entered him in the race gets the prize money, but he could break his leg right after the finish line, and now you just bought a dead horse. And if there's three, they'd shake the bells and draw number three, you won the horse. So that's how the claiming race works. And that helps keeps the horseman honest because you're not going to get a $2 million horse and race them for 5,000 claiming. Because if your horse is worth $2 million, you don't want to sell them for 5,000. So that's just one of the ways that they try to keep the horse, horseman in check. Um, but this horse, uh, this Prince horse from J.D. Marsh Farms, when I was in Meadowlands, uh, I saw him going for a tag, and I think it was about 35000 or 50000 claiming. So the claiming races, I've seen them as low as 1500 They probably don't even go that cheap anymore, but back in the 70s. And, and they have claiming races that probably go up to 200000 $250,000. So you get all, all those calibers of horses in between. But to make the long story short, this horse that uh, I, I only saw as a baby on the farm, and I knew he was an athlete, and I knew he, had, he was intelligent, and I knew he was fast, and I saw him racing at Meadowlands in New Jersey. And I told Billy, I said, you claim this horse. And he looked at the racing farm, the newspaper, and he, he sees, you know, last, last, last. And then he had a long layup, which is a, 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 a red flag saying, hey, something must have happened to this horse, he got hurt. So uh, if I had the money, the 35000 back then, I'd be a millionaire now because I would have bought that horse that day for 35000 claiming. He ended up winning, never, never saw another claiming race the rest of his life. The next week he went into an allowance race, he won. Went into a handicap race, he won. Went into a stake race, he won. And me and Billy just... <laughs> and, and Billy didn't believe me because I was only about 18, 19 years old. He says, that was this kid now. But I, I had first-hand experience working at J.D. Marsh's farm, multi-millionaire, had some really nice horses, yeah, but they didn't want to believe me. So, but it was from there that led me to meet Kenny Payne because it was in that little barn. Okay, go ahead. And uh, this gentleman pulls up in a limousine, he gets out in a red crush velvet and he has uh, some 18 year old under his arm and he walks into the barn and he only brought three horses from England. And, uh, Come to find out, he was leading trainer in all of Northern England for almost a decade, for about 10 years in a row. He was one of the leading trainers in England. Then he wrote that book, The Coup, and he ended up getting kicked out of England. And even to come to this country, he had to put some kind of a bond um, because he had such a bad reputation. The experience with Kenny Payne is uh, there was nobody in the barn that afternoon, and one of his horses had fallen and, and got cast, as they call it, when they lay laying on the ground and they can't get themselves back up. Um, and when he did get up, he had injured one of his uh, legs. So I took it upon myself to stick the horse's legs in some ice boots. And I got two ice, ice boots from our side of the barn, and I stuck his, the, uh, the horse's legs in the ice boots, filled it up with ice, and he stood there like an old cow, like he's been doing it his whole life. 
And then uh, Kenny Payne walked into the bar and he said, who did this? And they said, I did, sir. Your horse got casted and injured. I thought uh, I'd try to uh, numb the pain. Uh, that's the first thing you want to do within the first 48 hours is for inflammation is to, to freeze it or put lots of ice on it. So he says, you know, this horse never saw a pair of boots like this before. He says, I want you to be my head lad. So he was so impressed with what I did for him and I took a horse that never saw boots before and I stuck him in a set of boots and um, he wanted me to become his, his assistant trainer. So we made arrangements for me to go down to Gulfstream to give him a couple months to go get his uh, stable well set up down at Gulfstream, Florida. And I took a couple months off and uh, gathered up my things and I drove down to Florida to, to work for Kenny Payne. Uh, my whole life be prior to that, working in uh, racehorses was, uh, you know, you, you buy a horse, you try to improve with them and race them against some better horses and try to beat them. And uh, Kenny Payne changed all that. Uh, he taught me, you take a horse that's worth two or three million dollars and you race them for $2,500. And you don't let anybody know he's worth two million dollars. You think, let everybody think that he's a piece of junk. And uh, he did that with two-year-olds, so he completely changed uh, my frame of thinking about the horse race in, uh, race horse industry, and he showed me a whole new ball game. And the first thing he said the day he hired me, he says, do not ever bet on one of my horses. And I never could understand that, because all the trainers that I worked for before, we used to bet on the horses, hoping they'd win, and, and then plus you always get a, um, a tip or a you know, a, a little bonus every time the horses would win, and plus whatever he bet on them. But he never wanted me to bet, and I could never understand that until um, I learned more about Kenny Payne. Uh, what what Kenny would do is he'd take a two-year-old that nobody ever, ne never raced before, nobody knows him, and he'd have, he had actually had some of his jockey friends from England come and exercise him in the morning. Because as soon as you put a stranger on the horse and you tell a stranger to go ahead and let this horse go, they're going to know uh, they're on a Porsche, you know, they're in a, a Jaguar, they got a, a fast horse underneath them. Uh, so it was very important. In England, uh, it's a whole different setup. You, you, you're racing on farms. Your horse comes off the farm and goes into the track and races and then comes back to the farm. So everybody on that farm is the only one uh, that would know anything about that horse. But in this country, there's thousands of horses all stabled together. All the jockeys walking around, everybody's talking about each other's horses, and um, this, uh, it's, it's a lot tougher to uh, hide any information on the racetrack. But what, what Kenny would do is would get a two-year-old that, that was a champion, and uh, he'd actually put him in a, a main special weights the first time. A main race is a horse that has never won a race before, but main special weights, nobody could claim him. And uh, the first time I experienced this was with a horse called Real Salty, and it was at Gulfstream the first couple of months I started working for him. It was the best horse that he had. He was a, a true champion, but nobody knew he could run. And uh, he hired this, this uh, jockey uh, and put him on the horse's back in a maiden race. And he says, I don't care where you finish, but do not win this race. So the jockey nonchalantly came out of the gate and just kind of let the horse run on its own. And then when he went around the final turn, he started gaining and uh, could have probably won the race, uh, but the jockey eased him back and ended up finishing fourth. And uh, when he got off the horse, he, he told Kenny, he says, man, this is the fastest horse I ever rode. So he, just by riding that horse at one time, but the fact that he did not win kept that horse a maiden. So he could race against other horses that have never won a race in their life, though he could have probably easily have won his first time out. But he was, he, uh, his first time out, he's probably, you know, might have only been five or ten to one because people were betting on him because they, they knew just as much as everybody else. They, they had no information on the horse. Um, but then we never raced that horse again at Gulfstream. We ended up taking him up to Pennsylvania. And I couldn't believe my eyes, but he put him in a, a race, I think it was for 50,000 claimant, which this horse was worth millions. Uh, oh, and it, it was a while too before he raced him again. So there was a long time off from his first race to his second race, because he just took it easy with the horse, and, you know, nurtured him and babied the horse. And then several months later, we took him up to Pennsylvania. 
Um, at the Gulf Stream closed, we stayed, we stabled out in uh, Penn National, and he put him in a main race, and he had another uh, jockey that was working for him, and and uh, he ended up finishing dead last in a much easier race than his first race in his life. He went from Gulf Stream, which was a, a classy track, made special weights, some really fast horses, to Penn National, a couple of notches down, and he put him in a much, much easier race. So uh, he ended up finishing last. So that brought the odds the next time uh, way up. Every time we raced him, he, he kept finishing last, last, last. And then finally he got him into a really cheap race. I believe it was like 25,000, it might even been 10,000 claiming. So we went from the best at Gulf Stream to some of the worst in Pennsylvania with only about five or six starts. The only good start that he had was that first race, he finished fourth. But everything else is last by 28 lengths. Last, last, last. So the odd board went way up to the roof. And that, that's where Kenny used to make his money. He'd, he'd bet on the horse at tremendous odds, like 20 to 1 odds, 30 to 1 odds. And he used to tell me, he says, no bank in America is going to give you 30 to 1 in one minute. The race is over in 57, 59 seconds. So uh, what he would do, he'd never bet at the racetrack. He'd get on the phone and call these uh, bookies all over the world. He'd call England 2000, Florida 2000, uh, Las Vegas 2000, Atlantic City 2000, little nominations because if you gave one guy 200,000 at 30 to one and he owes you $600 million, you're, nev you're never gonna see that money. And that one person could never come up with that kind of cash. But by giving somebody 2000 and getting 30 to one, so it's 6,000 back, uh, that was a little more realistic, but he'd have hundreds of those. Uh, all over the world, so, uh, and you could always tell the day before the race, Kenny would always be a little edgy, a little nervous, he used to ask me, everything okay, is the horse okay, and you could always tell he was a little bit on edge, because he had a lot of money vested in it, but uh, when they rang that bell and the horse came out of the gate, uh, way in the front of the pack, you know, and they said, they're off and it's real salty, and he'd just lead the way and nobody could ever come close to him. Uh, if they did, the jockey would just ask him to go a little farther, a little faster, and he'd just pull away, and he, and, uh, he ended up. But the thing is, Kenny would always tell the jockey not to win by too many. You know, you don't want to show off the horse too much. You don't. He probably could have won by 15, 20, 30 lengths, maybe. Uh, but he ended up winning just by a length, so he just kind of slowed down at the end, let everybody catch up to him. Okay. He'd win the race, uh, and then... Uh, by not betting at the racetrack itself, because if, and that's why, that's why I learned that he, he never wanted me to bet on one of his horses, because if I bet even $200 and the horse's odds were 30 to one, my $200 might have brought it down to 28 to one or 25 to one. So his bets to the bookies wouldn't have paid as much. So just five d difference would, would have meant like $50,000 that he lost on my lousy couple hundred dollar bet. So that's how I figured out why he never wanted me to bet on one of his horses. So, uh, let me ask you a question because when we were at your home in Rhode Island, uh, we're backing up a little bit here. You were talking about using the backside of your hand mm -hmm. for diagnosing a horse. I found that very, very interesting because I never heard that before. Talk about that. That actually uh, happened uh, when I first started at Gulfstream working for Kenny Payne. Well, that's something I learned in college. Uh, the, the back of your hand is much more heat sensitive than the front of your hand. The front of your hand has calluses and, and uh, tissue on it with a back. You can, so whenever you, you, to diagnose a horse, they don't talk to you, they don't tell you they got a headache, they don't tell you what ankles are hurting, or what knees are hurting, you have to figure it out on your own. So the first thing I would do every morning is run the back of my hand down the horse's legs. I check all around his knees, all around his shins, his ankles, even his feet, most importantly. And that goes right back to this horse real salty that I was just telling you about. And that explains why he never raced that much after that race in uh, Gulfstream, because we went from Gulfstream to Pennsylvania, but there was about a four month delay in there. Because after uh, Real Salty ran his first race, uh, we took him out for exercising and some training, and we worked him out again. And when he came back from that workout, I believe he had uh, hit himself with his back foot. The, um, 
that's, that's one of the reasons why we put bandages on the horse, but uh, sometimes they'll clip themselves. Or, but anyway, uh, Real Salty came back after a workout and I felt on his legs and if everything would have, would have been fine, he would have been ice cold. But I felt some warmth there in his, in his front left tendon. Okay. And I started squeezing the tendon with my fingers and he flinched a little bit, so I knew he had injured that tendon. So I called Kenny and I said, hey, Kenny, I think this horse just hurt himself. And he's looking and he's squeezing the legs. And he says, ah, you don't know what you're talking about. The horse is fine. But being his best horse, his fastest two-year-old, and uh, he did call for a second opinion. And he called the veterinarian over and the veterinarian confirmed what I said. Yes, this horse hurt his tendon. He's a couple months off. So uh, after that day, Everything I said was gospel. Okay. And, you know, if I said, you know, the horse needs some time off, okay, Ben, you, you got it. You have the training, you have the knowledge, you have the expertise. Yeah, because I was on, I had only worked for him for a couple of months and he didn't know me from a hole in a wall. But after I caught his best horse, injured himself, and it was an invisible injury, nobody, you know, it's like a magic trick uh, being able to predict that that horse just injured himself. Um, but he, anything I said after that was gospel. And there was another horse when we were in Atlantic City that he had brought from England and he, he was fast. He was small, he could only go a short distance, um, but he had, uh, he had some bad knees right at, at the get-go. He was born with deformed knees. And um, we ended up bracing him and Kenny did bet on him, I believe. I, I, I don't think I bet on him because I knew he, before the race we had to put him on ice because he was in some discomfort. Um, but he ended up finishing, I believe, he didn't quite finish the race. Around the 70-yard pole, he broke down, shattered his knee, and they ended up putting him in an ambulance, bringing him back to the barn. Now, this horse is in, uh, suffering pain. You know, his nostrils are flaring like crazy, sweat coming down, uh, holding his knee up. He's in profuse pain. And uh, we called the veterinarian. You know, Kenny came up to me first. He says, what do you think, Ben? And I says, well, I was squeezing the horse's knee. And I says, it feels like a hundred pieces of marble. You know, he shattered it, not just one crack or two cracks. This thing was all in pieces. And he says, okay, let's put him down. So we called the veterinarian over to destroy the horse, uh, to get him out of his pain and misery. And, and we told the, the uh, veterinarian that the horse is insured. And he panicked. He says, oh, we have to make sure, we have to take pictures, we have to take x-rays, we Verified. have to put him in a cast, we have to, and meanwhile, this poor horse suffered another two or three days, and then finally the result was in, he shattered his knee in about a hundred pieces. The same thing I told him in a matter of seconds, took the veterinarian days, and that horse, I felt so bad for that horse, he suffered, and so I kept him in ice, and I tried to keep him comfortable, uh, but it was a long three days for that little two-year-old. Then you told me a, a story of a horse I found very, very interesting. It was a horse that came from another country and you needed to clip him. Oh, yes. We, and then the sound of the clipper freaked them out. And talk I, about that. that yeah. I, I thought that was such a cool story. Yeah, that was when I was in college. Uh, it was a long-haired horse. I believe he was from Canada. And um, he was petrified of the clippers. And it was mostly the sound, the bzzz, you know, like a barber's clippers type thing. And every time anybody would try to clip him, he would just freak out. He'd rear up and he'd start striking out at you and he would go crazy. He did not want any part of those clippers. So he was assigned to me. It was one of the stalls that I cleaned every day. I fed him every day. I used to brush. He had no problem being brushed um, and groomed and saddled. No, no, no other issues other than he was petrified of those clippers. So what I did was, uh, uh, I believe I took a tape recording of the clippers or maybe used the actual clippers themselves. And I'd turn them on, but at a, at a distance. distance. And then I'd just go in there and brush them, and he could listen to the sound of the background. And then I'd increase the volume or bring the clippers closer. I think I did it on a tape recorder. And then, yes, it was a tape recorder, because eventually I could turn that tape recorder on full blast and rub the tape recorder all over his body, around his ears, his face, his nose, his legs, his belly. And then I knew the horse was ready, because the tape recorder rubbing on him would feel just like a pair of clippers rubbing on, I don't know how much difference. It wasn't the, the feel, it was the sound that scared the horse the most. Uh, but it made that horse dangerous. If you tried to go up to him with a pair of clippers, you'd be ready to fight. Um, so uh, one day I called my bond supervisor over and I says, hey, you wanna come by today? I'm gonna, I'm gonna clip this horse. And they said, what? 
So I crossed items, so I didn't have to have anybody standing there holding them. I just put one rope on one side, one on the other, and we're in the middle of the barn, and I plugged the clippers in, and I just clipped away. I probably just stood there like a little cow. And then anybody could clip them. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting, right. beautiful story. Yeah. yeah. So that was called desensitizer. You have to desensitize the horses to certain things. But uh, yeah, there's a, a lot that I learned in college and a lot that I learned on the racetrack. Uh, but the most uh, prominent gentleman that I worked for was Kenny Payne. And we had a little bit of a fallout and it all comes back to that uh, where he told me never bet on one of my horses. Well, after working for him for about three or four years. Oh, yes. <laughs> I remember this story. Yeah. Let's uh, hear it. He's, uh, I, I was working at Boston, and uh, he had a horse that had finished fourth in the Kentucky Derby. He was training. It wasn't his particular horse. He was training it for somebody else. But I knew it was a nice horse. He had been laid up for a while. And uh, he said, I'm, we're going to take this horse to Meadowlands, and we're going to let him go. Do you want to bet on him? And I said, yeah, sure because he told me never to bet on one of his horses. No, no you got permission. He's he's approaching me, he says, how much do you want to bet? Like he's going to put the bet on for me. I said, a thousand dollars. So he says, okay. So I put the horse on a van, shipped him out to Meadowlands with another crew, and me as an assistant trainer, I was supposed to stay at Boston and hold on the fort at Boston. And it was night racing at Meadowlands. But after I put that horse on the van, I thought about what he told me, and he had a girl jockey on the horse. And uh, I said, no, nah, this girl's not going to stiff the horse. She's going to try and, and let the horse go. And this horse has got a good chance of winning the race. So I thought, and I said, oh, that thousand's probably enough. So I, I begged, borrowed, and stole whatever I can. I, I could. I, I put a bunch of money together, uh, jumped in my car. I drove the four hours out to Meadowlands. And uh, just before the race, because I waited till the last minute, because... I didn't want to bring the odds down too far, but it still did. I think I, it was 20 to 1, and I put another couple of thousand dollars on it, brought it down to like 16 to 1. Uh, but still, uh, 2016 to 1 would have been $32,000. Um, but somehow, he must have set me up. He saw me at the window betting on the horse. He says, what are you doing here? I says, all right, come to bat. He said, we're going to let this horse go. I just, Wonder about a little extra. He says, you call yourself an assistant trainer, you get out of here. So we had a big argument. I drove back to Boston, and I pretty much kind of got fired. And the next day, this gentleman named Danny Poliziani found out about it, and he desperately tried to hire me, because uh, he knew of my knowledge and expertise with the horses. And he says, you come work for me, I'll give you whatever it was, $1,000 a week, or whatever, I'm gonna give you three of my best horses. So with Kenny, I was taking care of 30, 40 horses responsible for them all anyway. But uh, Danny Polizzi and he offered me a job that was very simple, take care of these three horses. And I, I did work for him for about a week or so, and every one of those horses won that week. So there was bonus money, they call it stakes. Uh, after the horse wins, they stake the, the grooms. So I ended up making a lot of money that week, but that's when I walked away. It was right around Thanksgiving time. Uh, I was the closest I've ever been to Rhode Island uh, in many years since 19, uh, 75, this was in the 80s now, um, and uh, I thought about my parents, and and I said, if I'm going to stay in the, and, and, and this, this other gentleman, whose name is Joe Villotti, he was the vice president of TWA Airlines, he had some horses with Kenny, and when he found out about our fallout, he says, why don't you come train for me, come to New York, you'd be my trainer, and I said, uh, thanks, but no thanks, because my parents were in the back of my mind. So I did work for Danny for another two weeks, and then I just walked away from the horse industry altogether at that point. I ended up uh, moving back to Lincoln. It was around the holidays, so you're thinking about your parents. And I knew if I stayed in the horse business, uh, I had to leave Rhode Island. There was no future for horses in Rhode Island anymore with the shutting down of Lincoln Downs, Narragansett Park, and then uh, this, you know, the horse racing business just went right down the tubes in Rhode Island. And if I had pursued it, I would have had to pursue it out of the state. So I probably never would have saw my parents again. So I made that decision, went home, and I started a paving business. Okay. <laughs> but there was a story you were telling me. You, you got involved in, in betting, and you were winning, and you bet some more, and you were winning, and you bet some more, and then you lost, and then yeah. your wife said? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Palooza. Uh, yeah. That was funny. That was in Saratoga. I still like to frequent Saratoga every August. It's the August place to be. They got some of the finest horses, finest horsemen in the country. And, and every August, I, I, I make an attempt to get there. Uh, I started about almost 30 years ago. Uh, when I left on a, I think it was a Friday. I came back on a Monday. We drove the car up. We got a hotel room. We went to the races. We bet on the horses. And uh, when I came back Monday, I had like six or seven hundred dollars more than what I left with on Friday. So I okay. covered all the meals, all the hotels, the gas, all the fun. So I said, "This is a vacation." I says, "I got to do this more often." So I started making a habit of going up every year. And then uh, my wife and I went up about six or seven years ago. And and what I do with my strategy at Saratoga is I go on the Travis Day because the Travis Day is uh, Travis is like the Kentucky Derby. It's a big, big race. It's a you know, grade one stakes. They give away almost a half a million dollars. Um, and, but that day they also have a, a race called the Hopeful. There's three or four really good races. And the best horses in the country are entered in those races. You get the best jockeys, the best trainers, some of the richest owners. So in, in that caliber of racing, there's not so much race fixing going on. When you get into these cheaper tracks with $1,500 horses, and the jockeys are all out for themselves. They're trying to fix the trifecta, and the, and the owners and trainers, if, there's a lot of uh, foul play going on. Okay. So, but when you get into the real high caliber of horses, nobody's gonna pay $50,000 to get their horse into this race and tell the jockey to finish last. You just put them in a junk race and tell them to finish last it doesn't cost you anything. But anyway, what I like to do at Saratoga is uh, I go there, uh, with about two or three hundred dollars in my pocket, never anymore, because I only bring in what I expect to lose. And uh, and out of the twelve races or fifteen races, sometimes I'll pick three or four, and uh, I pick the best ones. And I use the handicap as advice as well, because I'm not there watching these horses exercise every morning, and I'm not on top of it anymore uh, like I used to be. Uh, so I'll pick four out of the whole day. And I'll sit there and I'll wait for the first race to come up and I'll bet 200 to win um, the one that I think got a chance in that particular race. And nine out of 10 times he'll win, now I've got 400. You only get even money because these are all favorites that I'm betting on. So you bet the two and now I've got four. So I'll wait for the next good race to come up and I'll bet the four. And a lot of times he'll win and now I've got eight. And then I'll sit and wait for that third race. I'll bet the eight. And uh, if he wins, I've got 16. Okay. And I was with my wife one day, and it got to that point. I think I was even closer to about 2,000. And no, it was an, actually, I won the fourth, fourth time. And I, and I bet the 16, say, got it up to 32. And, and I just felt motivated. I got to try one more time. The way I looked at it, if I lost, I'm out $200. I had a great day. I had fun, <laughs> watched the races, um, but my wife didn't see it that way. So uh, I did go one more time, and I, I bet about four thousand dollars. I bet it all to win. That's how I do it. I, the sauce has to win, or I get nothing. And I got beaten the photo. I got beat a nose. We had to wait for the photo to come up, and my horse got beat by a nose. And Maria was calling me all every name in the book. Loser! You stupid! She was so disappointed, she looked at it as if I lost $4,000. Well, you <laughs> sort of did. <laughs> I looked at it as I lost, 200, I lost okay. 200. That's all I lost. Yeah. I didn't care about what I could have won. Uh, it would have been nice. Matter of fact, just last year, we ended up winning about $4,000 uh, this last August. So out of all the years, there are some years that I lose, but the most I'll lose is 300. So if I've been going up 30 years, and let's say I lost 10 of them, which I know I haven't, Mm -hmm. I lost three thousand dollars. Well, I just made four thousand last time. <laughs> so, yeah, my winnings way exceed the losses. So, all right, and that's uh, that's the key to gambling. You don't have to win every time. You just have to win most of the time. Right, Ben. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome for I'm sharing you. your your knowledge. Because I don't know a thing about horses. Yeah. But I learned something from you, yeah. and it was so interesting to me to learn this stuff. So. Uh, that's it for this interview. Hope all of you out there enjoy this video with Ben Piquenot.